geology students this is the first video for Wednesday July the 8th and there'll be all the material covered today in this video which is called summer 34 is going to be on the next test which is next Monday um, July the 13th we talked about P S L and R waves and um, we should remember that P and S waves are body waves. They travel through the body of the Earth and all the way, all the way through the crust, the mantle, and further inward into the core. Whereas R and L waves only travel along the surface of the Earth. Um, a seismograph is a device that records an earthquake. And here you can see how it works. First, you bolt a cast iron plate into the ground it has to be beneath the soil straight into the rock then you have an L beam usually made of steel then you have um, a weight which is on a spring and then you have a rotating drum and there's a pen or a laser that points to this photographic film or paper and this rotates and so you know um, when the earthquake occurs it's going to record it because the the whole machine the whole seismograph is going to move except for um, this weight this weight will not move therefore it's going to record the earthquake this is what a seismogram looks like you can see that the first wave that hits is always the P wave then the S wave and then the R and the L waves over here but we're gonna focus our attention on the P and the S wave so remember the P wave is the fastest wave the P wave is gonna save your life because it's gonna give you some time to um, prepare and if you grew up back east like I did east of the Mississippi you might not have experienced earthquake drills but out west especially in California they school children know what to do when the um, alarm goes off which is and the alarm is based on P waves as soon as the US geological surveys the USGS is uh, seismologists uh, record a P wave they're going to immediately set off an alarm and students go, uh, practice they get under the, their desks their desks are really built a lot stronger than they are back east most people get killed when the ceiling falls down so if you're in a building out west and there's an earthquake or even back east because there could be an earthquake here in Tennessee I'll talk about that later but when it does happen and if you're inside get under a desk that's going to save your life as soon as you feel that vibration under your feet of those P waves get under a desk immediately and you will save your life um, if there are no desks in the room then you need to get under a doorway because that the the wall is stronger under the doorway that's the second safest place to be under a doorway if you're out if you're outside run away from the building because it's the building that's going to kill you the falling building um, so the P wave gets there first and then the dangerous S wave is going to get to you later do you remember the story your parents told you when you were a kid your dad and mom told you about the um, tortoise and the hare the tortoise and the hare they, they wanted to have a race and uh, as the race proceeded the hare started to uh, get far, um, farther and farther ahead of the tortoise because the hare could run faster, right? And assuming that the hare doesn't slow down, then the farther the race goes, the farther um, ahead the hare is going to be. Well, if you if you keep that in mind, you will understand um, how we're going to record the epicenter of, the, of an earthquake because there's a time interval between 
the arrival of the P wave, which is shown here with the first spike, and then the arrival of the S wave. So let's say that the P wave here arrived at 8.04.2 a.m. We don't use seconds. It's 8.04.2 a.m. So we that's when the P wave got there. Now let's say the S wave got there at 8.07.9 a.m. 8.07.9 a.m. How much time has elapsed between the arrival of the P wave and the arrival of the S wave? Well, you subtract. It's going to be equal to 3.7 minutes, right? So, um, you can, the first thing the seismologist does when an earthquake occurs is you figure out the S minus P time interval. which is equal to the difference between the arrival of the S wave minus the arrival of the P wave. Once you get that, you can figure out how far you are from the earthquake. Let me show you how to do that. I'm going to show you by Googling. So go to our old friend Google and take a look at the S minus P time curve. Okay, so here's an S minus P time curve right here. Oh, I don't like this one because this one's on the. Uh, let's do this one here. Oh, okay, we can do this one. Okay, so what's the S minus P time, uh, time interval? It's 3.7 minutes, right? So what we do is we take the the distance between here and here and uh, and you write it on a piece of paper so just that exact distance from here to here whatever it is and then you move those two points until they match with the curve <coughs> and that tells you how far you are from the epicenter of an earthquake <coughs> so the greater the s minus p time interval the farther you are from the earthquake. If you're right on the epicenter of the earthquake, the S minus P time interval is going to be zero. But the greater the S minus P time interval, the farther you are from the earthquake. <coughs> Don't vape. You know, I'm coughing like me. All right, so anyway. Um, why is that? Well, it's a hair. And the tortoise story, the, <clears throat> the farther the race goes, the farther ahead the hare gets. The same way, the S wave travels faster. I mean, the P wave travels faster than the S wave. <clears throat> so the farther you are from the earthquake, the greater the S minus P time interval. And if you know the S minus P time interval, you can figure out the distance to the earthquake. Which means you can use a method called earthquake epicenter triangulation which states that if you have uh, if you're at, let's say an earthquake occurred somewhere in North America and you got your seismogram uh, for Seattle Washington well you could go put a pit a point on a map for Seattle Washington and let's say you get your s minus p time interval and you find out you're 1,000 kilometers from Seattle the earthquake occurred 1,000 kilometers from Seattle. Then you could draw a, a, a circle 1,000 kilometers in diameter. And the earthquake occurred somewhere on that circle, right? Now let's say we had another seismograph in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we figured out it's 2,300 miles away, 2,300 kilometers away. We draw another circle. Two circles meet at two points, as you, you will see when you watch this video. You need three seismograms to pinpoint the epicenter of an earthquake. First, you need to know the locations of your seismographs. Put a point on those places on the map. 
Then you use your S minus P time intervals by f recording the S arrival time, P arrival time, subtract, figure out the distance between your seismic station and the earthquake epicenter. Then you draw three circles. Where the three circles meet, that's where the earthquake epicenter began. And seism seismologists, uh, you can look at all these stars here. These are all the seismic um, stations around our planet where people measure, seism seismologists work to record earthquakes. So we've got, we're going to have data from all around the world. And we're going to be able to pinpoint the epicenter of the earthquake relatively quickly. Um, when an earthquake occurs, there are a variety of different threats, but um, the biggest threat is a fall, are falling buildings. And so when you move out, if you were to move out west, <clears throat> where we have a lot of earthquakes, um, you need to do certain things to protect your family. First thing you need to do is... Um, have a plan so that um, if an earthquake occurs um, there's a lesser likelihood of you dying as I mentioned before if your house falls down or the building building falls down you're going to die those older buildings are more likely to fall fall down but what you could do is several things one is you could um, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and bolt all your furniture to the floor. Then you want to bolt all your bookcases to the wall. Uh, you don't want anything moving around in your house during the earthquake. That's going to kill you. Um, use a heavier gauge for your natural gas um, pipes going into your house. So they're less likely to burst because leaking natural gas can lead to a fire. Um, you want to have some rations and uh, and um, water in case uh, you don't have a house to live in for a few days or a few months so you can get by. You need to have um, all of your chandeliers um, bolted with a special brace so that it won't fall down. Because if it falls down and someone's underneath it, it's going to kill them. And... Uh, you want to put a brace on your chimney if you have a chimney. So the chimney, a lot of people get killed by their chimneys falling through the roof. Those are the basic things that you can do to protect yourself. And you need to do that if you're in California. Also, when you uh, buy a house, make sure that the concrete is, um, is reinforced with rebar, which will make it stronger and less likely to fracture. And... Now we're going to talk about seismic tomography. And what is seismic tomography? Well, I mentioned before the P and S waves can travel through the interior of the Earth. And we know that P waves are faster than S waves. I don't know why that thing is there. Okay. So, I hate that. Let's see. Um, so, P waves are waves are vibrational waves and they will travel through liquid solids and gases s waves you got to remember though are waves that require the rock to deform in a, a predictable way and that doesn't happen with liquids and gases another way of saying it is and please don't forget this is that s waves cannot travel through liquids and gases. They can only go <clears throat> through solids. The other thing you want to remember about these seismic waves, P and S waves, is they increase in velocity with increased density. I'll repeat that. Seismic waves increase in velocity with increased density. What is density? But mass over unit, mass divided by unit volume, right? What's denser, gold or feathers? Gold, right? There's dense, uh, the same size cube of gold is going to be a lot heavier than for feathers. 
what is denser, salt water or fresh water? Salt water, right? What's what's denser, cold molasses or hot molasses? Cold molasses. It's heavier for its size. Okay, now the as far as these body waves go, these P and S waves, they increase in velocity with increasing density. Let me ask you a, bit, a question. As you go deeper into the Earth, does density increase? Sure it does, because you got all the weight of the rocks pushing down on the rocks down there, and so the rocks down deeper underground are going to be higher in density. So therefore your P, as you notice here, P and S wave velocities, how do you get rid of that thing? Uh, your P and S wave velocities increase as you go deeper and deeper into the Earth. They increase. But notice what happens right here when you meet the boundary between the outer core and the mantle. All of a sudden, what happens? Well, the S waves, S waves stop when you hit the outer core here at about 2,200 kilometers into the Earth. The S waves stop right there. So, why do the S waves stop? Well, what's the outer core made of? Liquid iron. The S waves can't get through the liquid outer core, right? And so you have no S waves when you go in the outer core. And that what's that tell us? Well, it tells us the outer core must be a liquid or a gas, since the S waves stop there. How do we know it's a liquid? Well, we know that the uh, velocity of the P waves through the outer core, and that some using some heavy duty mathematics that we can figure out that that is the outer core must be made of liquid iron liquid iron um, another reason why we know the outer core must be made of liquid iron besides seismic tom tomography is that we have a magnetic field around our planet so when you take out a compass it's going to point north why because there's a magnetic field around our planet. Well, what produces magnetism? Faraday figure, figure that out in the 1890s. Only electricity can make magnetism. So how does the Earth? How is the Earth making an electrical field? And what is electricity? Electricity is moving electrons. So the rotation of Earth's liquid outer core causes electrons to move fast through the liquid iron. And producing an electrical field producing a magnetic field so that's another reason why we know the outer core must be liquid then um, the inner core is solid we know that because the P waves uh, give us the density of the inner core and it's equivalent to that of solid iron the mantle is made of peridotite we talked about that earlier on so we, how do we know what's inside the Earth? We know from seismic tomography, from the, the velocity changes of P and S waves as you go deeper into the Earth. But think about it. Can't we use this to make money, which is what uh, seismic tomography is really about? Um, if we're going to find oil and natural gas, can't we use earthquake waves, seismic waves, to figure out where that oil and natural gas is? S waves aren't going to go through natural gas and oil, right? So uh, we can't wait, though, for an earthquake. Uh, ExxonMobil or BP or the big Schlumberger, those big oil drilling companies, they can't wait for that. So what they do is they make their own little earthquakes. And this is what the, the these huge trucks do is they shake the ground and then they let these little earthquakes go into the earth and then they look at the P and S waves and see how they change with depth to, and they use this to find oil and natural gas you can see here uh, they you can also use it to find a magma chamber so that's quite interesting that's another uh, thing that we can use to benefit our, our economy when we're measuring how strong an earthquake is, there's two ways of doing it. 
the one you've heard of probably, I'm sure you've heard of this, is the Richter scale. The Richter scale. And then the other one you might not have heard of it is the modified Mercalli intensity scale. So those are the two main ways that we can measure earthquakes. First, let's talk about the Richter scale. The Richter scale. What is the Richter scale based on? Well, let's, let me show you. The Richter scale is based on your seism seismogram. I'll show you in a moment. And it's based on something called amplitude. So what is the amplitude? Well, here's a seismogram. All you got to do is you got to measure the height of the largest peak that you get on your seismogram. And that's what Richter, the Richter scale is based on. The height going from the center all the way to the top of the highest wave. In this case, it would be 19 millimeters. <clears throat> so it's Richter magnitude is based on the amplitude of the highest si the highest peak in your seismogram. And it, it is a logarithmic scale. What's that mean? Do you remember logs from back in high school? Uh, let's do a little basic math here. Let's do some math here. Some people love math, others hate it, but we're going to have to do some. Okay. Logs. Logs, uh, the log of base 10, you probably remember this, right? Log of base 10 of 100 is equal to what? How, how do you know? Well, think of it this way. 10, this is base 10, base, base, on base 10, 10 to the x is equal to 100. That's what this means. So what must x be equal to? to 10 to the what is equal to 100? It's equal to 2, right? So your answer is... Two. What's the log of a thousand equal to then? Ten to the what is a thousand? Three. Right? Okay. Let's um, do some real work world comparison so we really understand this. Let's say we have an earthquake in San Diego, California, and it has a ma it's a Richter magnitude 4. And we want to compare it to one that occurred in Los Angeles with a Richter magnitude 5. And we want also to compare it to one that occurred in San Francisco Richter magnitude 6, and then one in Santa Barbara, Richter magnitude 7. Okay, Richter magnitude is based on tens, right? So another way of saying it is, if we're going to compare a San, the San Diego earthquake versus a Los Angeles earthquake, you can already tell that Los Angeles has a bigger earthquake because it has a, it's Richter magnitude 5, right? But how much bigger is it in terms of amplitude? Well, it's based on base 10. So all you got to do is ask, ask yourself the question. Um, let me write this down here. Just write it like this if you want to compare the amplitudes. 10 
to del over to the delta x exponent. That's going to with delta x being equal to the difference. Try to write this in Richter magnitude. The difference in Richter magnitude. So that we're comparing LA versus San Diego. What's the difference in Richter magnitude? 5 minus 4 is 1. Plug it in. 10 to the 1 is what? 10. So what that tells you is that the amplitude of the Los Angeles earthquake is 10 times greater than that of the San Diego earthquake. Another way of saying it is if the pen of the seismo on the seismogram moved one inch for San Diego, it moved 10 inches for Los Angeles. There's a 10, 10 times bigger amplitude for the Los Angeles earthquake. Now let's compare San Francisco versus San Diego. What's the Richter magnitude of San Francisco? Six. What's, that, what's the Richter magnitude of San Diego? Four. So what would the difference in Richter magnitude be? Six minus four is two. Plug it in. Ten to the two is what? One hundred telling us that the San Francisco earthquake has an amplitude 100 times greater than the San Diego earthquake. That's a huge difference. If the pen moved um, one inch for San Diego, it would move almost nine feet for San Francisco, right? Big difference. Now let's take, compare Santa Barbara with San Diego. Richter magnitude of the Santa Barbara earthquake is a seven and that of San Diego is a 4. What's the difference in Richter magnitude? What's delta x? 7 minus 4 is 3. 10, Q, 10 to the 3 is what? 10 times 10 times 10, 1,000. That tells us that a magnitude 7 earthquake in Santa Barbara would have an amplitude 1,000 times bigger than that of San Diego. Or another way of saying it is, the San Diego earthquake would have an amplitude 1,000 times smaller than that of Santa Barbara. That's how Richter magnitude is measured. It's based on logs. And you can use this simple formula here to, to compute amplitude, which is the biggest peak in your seismogram. But let's say we wanted to figure how much, compare the energy released, the amount of energy released between these four earthquakes. Then we would have to use something else, which is um, a mathematical measurement only used by geologists, which is log to the base 30. It also uses the difference in Richter magnitude, but it's based on 30s. And this is energy release. Energy released. Okay, I'm just going to write R here. Energy released. Let's compare the amount of energy released by magnitude 4 earthquake in San Diego versus Los, uh, magnitude 5 in Los Angeles. What's the difference in Richter magnitude? 5 minus 4 is 1. 30 to the 1 is what? 30. So um, a magnitude 5 earthquake in Los Angeles would release 30 times more energy than one a magnitude 4 in San Diego. In other words, 30 magnitude 40 earthquakes is equal to one magnitude 5 earthquakes in terms of energy released. That's a huge difference. That's why a 5 is so much bigger than a 4. Let's compare San Francisco with a 6 and San Diego with Richter magnitude 4. 6 minus 4 is 2. Delta X is equal to 2. What's 30 squared? 900. One magnitude 6 earthquake releases 900 times more energy than one magnitude 4 earthquake. 900, so one magnitude 6 earthquake releases 900 times more energy than one magnitude 4. Now let's compare 
Santa Barbara with a magnitude 7 versus San Diego with a Richter magnitude of 4. What's delta x? 7 minus 4 is 3. What's 30 cubed? 30 times 30 times 30 is 27,000. So one magnitude 7 earthquake is equivalent to 27,000 magnitude 4 earthquakes. You see that's a huge difference. So a magnitude 4 is a nothing. A magnitude 7 is enormous. That's how we use Richter magnitude. But there's another way of measuring earthquakes, and it's called the Modified Mortality Intensity Scale. And it's based on uh, building damage. And it goes from Roman numeral 1 to 10. And what happens is you have these people who volunteer to the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, you have their cell phone numbers, and the seismologist will call them and say, what did you experience um, from the earthquake? If you felt nothing, you would say Roman numeral 1. If you felt um, that it was strong and people were scared and heavy furniture moved and some plaster or drywall fell down and slight damage, you would say numeral 6. If everything around you has been destroyed and you barely survived, you would say Roman numeral 10. And then, let me show you how that works. So then, um, you can get all of these, uh, Rome, one Roman numeral from each of these people, let's say you had 10,000 people, then you could go ahead and make a map like this with the, your data. So the people here said that it was a six, a strong earthquake. People here felt a little bit less, so it was a five. Here you can see the epicenter. And then here four, and then three, and then two, and one. Obviously these buildings got damaged more, and then these, and then these, and then these, and then these, and these got affected the least. Well, it's not a perfect bullseye. Why? Because um, the chances of your building surviving an earthquake are based on how well your building is built. And number two, the geology underneath the building. So these maps, Mercalli maps, are used by planners, city planners, state planners, county planners, uh, and developers to figure out what are the chances of your house falling down or experiencing severe damage from a magnitude 6 or 7 or 8? And then that's how they calculate your insurance rates. And also the value of your real estate. So the value of real estate depends on large part upon, on geology. Let me show you why. Okay, um, we're very l uh, lucky in a lot of ways because um, one thing I love about living in Tennessee is I could buy a house. And uh, people who live in the San Francisco Bay Area live in a different world than us. Um, only the extreme rich can afford a house. Uh, to give you an example, um, the cheapest places there, uh, little houses there, about one one bedroom or maybe 600 square feet, are going to be a million dollars. And so people can't afford to get nice houses there. Um, and so let's take a look here. Here's the San Francisco Bay here. And this area right next to the, the bay is uh, built on wet mud. And it's called the Marina District. The Marina District, if you go to San Francisco, that's where 
Fisherman's Wharf is. That's where all the tourists go. Over here, you have dry mud. And over here, you have sand. And over here, you have solid rock. Well, if you want to survive an earthquake, you want to be on solid rock. Why? Because the earthquake waves are not amplified. They're, they're, uh, by, they're, they're not amplified as they travel through solid rock. So you have the highest chance of surviving an earthquake here, away from the Bay Area. Uh, uh, sand is, is not as good as solid rock, but it's better than wet mud. Wet mud over here on the, in the Marina District is the worst um, type of geology to build on. Why? Because wet mud will liquefy. That means it'll be like a quicksand. Uh, liquefaction causes buildings to fall into the earth and disappear, people to disappear. Um, Let me see, I've got to quit a few things here because uh, I'm using too much memory. Okay, so the bottom line is wet mud is the worst material to build on because something called liquefaction can occur. That means the ground, if you build on wet mud, that wet mud is going to become a liquid. And so people will just disappear into the ground. Buildings will fall into the ground. You can see that if the vibrating is just a few seconds, you can see this SUV sank down, and if it was a few more seconds, it would have disappeared. Buildings start to sink into the ground. This one did through liquid. If you build on wet mud, um, you have a chance of sinking into the ground during an earthquake. If it lasts a few seconds, only part of the building will sink into the ground, but you could die from that. So, um, it's important to know when you buy real estate what is under the ground because that's going to affect the foundation of your house, your your, pi your water pipes that are going into your house, whether they'll crack or not, your sewage pipes, but especially out west where you have earthquakes. You need to know not just what the house looks like, or does it have a fireplace or granite countertops, but what's underneath the ground because that's going to affect are you going to have cracks in your wall? Is your building is are you going to have a settling of your house? And wet mud's the worst, and solid rock is the best. Problem is solid. If, so then you might say, "Oh, I'll just if I got to move out there, I'll build, I'll buy a house on solid rock." Well, you can't because those houses out there in solid rock in the San Francisco Bay Area are going to be ten, fifteen million dollars for a two-bedroom house. Just to give you an example, I, I've got this cousin who lives out in California. Uh, my uh, grandfather, when he passed away, he was a wealthy man, and he left all my his money to uh, my uncle, and he didn't give my dad anything. And that's another part of the story. Uh, part of the story, but anyway, so my my uncle got all the money from the inheritance, and he gave it to his kids. And so I've got this cousin called Chris. And he grew up like a spoiled rich brat with just millions and millions of dollars. And um, I grew up middle class, you know, c cutting coupons and looking for discounts. So we lived different lives. But he didn't really have, they kind of looked down at us for being their poorer cousins. But then one day he called me up with his annoying California accent. And he, he said, dude. I want you to come over to San Mateo and check out my condo. Yeah, it's, I, I, you know, it's a, it's got uh, 800 square feet, and it has its own yard, and I, and he said it cost a couple million, like three million dollars, and I thought, all right, I guess I should meet my cousin. Anyway, so I went out there, 
and he, and he has this yard, and it's about oh, uh, 12 feet by 12 feet, and he cuts the grass with scissors, and, and he says, and I said, you know, he's just a, he just uh, invited me over to show off. He didn't really care about me or anything. So I just, so I just said, uh, dude, I've got a real yard in Tennessee. <laughs> anyway, here's the Mar Mercalli index scale here. And you can read, uh, watch this video about liquefaction. Wet mud's the worst, solid rock's the best. So, what can we do to predict earthquakes? Well, we're not good yet at short-term prediction. What does short-term prediction mean? Well, that's the holy grail of seismology. What we want to be able to do is predict when an earthquake is going to occur so that we can, for example, tell the people in Los Angeles, Los Angeles there will be an earthquake occurring on July 18th, uh, and so everybody on July the 17th needs to evacuate the city and then we can save lives. That's what we want to be able to do. We're not there yet. Are we getting closer to it? Yes. Because there are some things that we can do to predict when an earthquake will occur. Before you get a big earthquake, sometimes you get four shocks. Four shocks. What are four shocks? Uh, let's talk about foreshocks and aftershocks. So before a big earthquake, you get a whole bunch of little earthquakes. Those are called foreshocks. And after the earthquake, you get a whole bunch of little earthquakes called aftershocks. I'll first tell you that aftershocks you need to know about. So when there's a big earthquake, uh, a lot of people get killed. The earthquake occurs, and their building is still standing. And they go inside and try and... Um, take their belongings out or rescue their cat or their dog or whatever. Then the aftershocks hit hundreds of little earthquakes and then the building's already been weakened and then it falls down on them. So you, you, the um, people, people tell you after the earthquake, don't just run back into that building unless it's for your wife or husband or your kids or somebody real important. Don't take that chance. Anyway, for, before a big earthquake, you get hundreds of little earthquakes. So sometimes we can use that to predict when an earthquake is about to occur. The other thing we can use is um, uh, radio waves. So uh, 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 an Australian scientist by the name of um, Anthony, Anthony Fraser Smith set up a radio antenna next to the San Andreas Fault. And what he found out is that uh, as the earth moved, it made a sound, 